1880s to the 1920s, we will look at the period called the long civil rights movement and, and when it begins in the 30s and 40s and why that is such a critical period where, where there's a shift in activism and the women involved in it. And then finally, we'll look at the period we know the best, the 1950s and 60s, uh, what one historian call, calls the classic era. And I'll end with a conclusion that helps us connect um, Black Lives Matter and the 21st century Black women's activism. So let's begin now by looking at this period from abolition to electoral politics. Black people in the Americas have fought a battle to claim and proclaim our civil rights, equality and humanity from 1619 and the arrival of African captives aboard a Dutch ship that arrives in Jamestown, Virginia. From that point to the end of the Civil War, African-American women who were captives rebelled aboard slave ships. Black women ran away from the people who claimed to own them. They sang, shouted, and prayed in an invisible institution of Black religious belief that affirmed God's hand in their future liberation. They masked their anger to survive, they feigned illness to claim their own time, and they sabotaged plantation food and property as acts of psychological empire empowerment. They petitioned courts and sued for freedom. We see two such women here, uh, Harriet Tubman, who you know well from the abolitionist movement, as well as her uh, being a spy for the Civil War and then following that period working on settlement houses for indigent Black people. And Marianne Shedd Carey, a journalist and abolitionist. Black women who were free or quasi-free in the North and Upper South in the 19th century wrote poetry, autobiographies, they gave speeches, and they founded newspapers. They organized benevolent societies to serve, serve fab, family and community needs. They formed literary societies for their intellectual stimulation and engagement. And they sold the quilts, baked the goods, and sold the food products that raised the money for the abolitionist cause, including Black women raising the money for William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator. Black political participation in 1870 was the result of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And you can see here that in 1870, there was significant Black male political participation. During this brief window of Black political um, action, when Black men voted and could hold public office, Black women organized to affect the vote and the political discussions among uh, Black people. They participated, spoke, debated in political meetings and Republican clubs to encourage the Black vote and to campaign for Black candidates. Black women organized their own political societies, some of them you see listed here, such as the Rising Daughters of Liberty in Richmond, Virginia. Historian Elsa Barkley Brown writes that those women, and I quote, actively engaged in the political campaigns by educating the community on the issues, raising funds for the candidates, and getting out the vote. Professor Brown argues and demonstrates that although Black women did not have the right to vote for themselves, they were still political agents who organized the Black political community. She writes, and I quote her again, that African-American women did not operate inside the formal political process. That does not negate the intensely political character of their actions. And I think we will see the intense political character of Black women's political activism for civil rights uh, beginning in this early period um, until the present. Black women also funded churches, schools, benevolent societies, and homes for the indigent and the homeless. 
They created local clubs and organizations such as the Bethel Literary and Historical Association in uh, Washington, DC. And in 1893, Black women in Boston founded the New Era Club and a monthly magazine. Black women also organized within their male dominated Black churches. From the period of their enslavement to the dawn of the 20th century then, a period covering almost three centuries, I want us to think about that, three centuries from the beginning of enslavement to this period following Reconstruction. During this entire time, Black women had organized with an intersectional agenda that included gender, race, and class struggles never choosing one as a priority over the other. Professor Brown and other scholars point out that Black women's agenda was never one for individual liberty, my rights, my vote, my family. Rather, it always embraced the community, the village, in the spirit of what South Africans call Ubuntu. I am because we are. And because we are, I am. In this beautiful picture of Anna Julia Cooper, uh, I want to introduce you to her seminal work, A Voice from the South, published in 1892, where she described the way Black women conceive of intersectionality as the centerpiece of our civil rights agenda. She wrote, only the Black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without using or using special patronage, then and there the whole Negro race enters with me. And again, it isn't about her entering it's about opening the door for everyone to enter. When Reconstruction ended in the 1870s, federal troops were removed from the South, leaving Black people, their property, their political participation, and their rights as citizens completely unprotected. The federal government not only turned its back on Black freedom and equality, but it also became became complicit as Jim, Jim Crow laws uh, validated lynching, rape, and all forms of social injustice and equality. And we see this, these inequalities in every aspect of American life, in cultural and artistic expression, in business and economics. We see discrimination in laws, government, custom, behavior, even in language. This Thomas Nass illustration that you see, Patience on a Monument, done in 1868, catalogs the depth and breadth of inhumanity suffered by African Americans, included, if you look at the bottom of that illustration, the bloodied body of a Black woman and her child who lay at the base of this monument to white supremacy. At the end of the 19th century, Black women responded to these centuries of old forms of American racism by organizing in new ways, including forming the first national civil rights organizations. So it will be Black women who formed the very first national civil rights organizations uh, uh, a decade or more before the NAACP is founded. In 1895, James W. Jacks, president of the Missouri Press Association, received a letter from the English Anti-Lynching League asking American journalists to help them battle lynching. In reply, Jacks wrote that, and I quote, the Negroes in this country are wholly devoid of morality. They consider it no disgrace to, uh, uh, but rather an honor to be sent to prison and to wear striped clothes. The women are prostitutes. 
and all are natural liars and thieves. Out of 200 in this vicinity, it is doubtful if there are a dozen virtuous women of that number who are not daily thieving from the white people. If we can think about someone like Anna Julia Cooper hearing these words, it's not surprising that in response, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin issues a call let us confer together that draws together 104 black women to the first national conference of colored women in America in response to what Jax had said about all black women being prostitutes. And St. Pierre Ruffin brings together women representing 36 different clubs in 12 different states. And this tells you something about the state and local organizing that was already going on nationwide. And it is St. Pierre Ruffin that will call all of these women, women uh, representing their clubs to come together. Similarly, the Colored Women's League of Washington, DC, founded in 1892, also launches an appeal in its magazine for Black women to organize a national association at their 1895 meeting. These two groups, the National Federation and the National Council of Women, come together in 1896 to form the National Association of Colored Women. This will be the first national civil rights organization in the country. They elect Mary Church Terrell as their first president. Their motto, lifting as we climb, also should resonate for you in terms of the quote I gave you from Anna Julia Cooper, right? When and where Black women enter, everyone else will also enter. So their motto, lifting as we climb, stressed moral, mental, material advancement, kind of the, Victor the Black Victorian woman's ideal of womanhood, but it also expressed uh, uplifting the race as the fight for women's suffrage and for racial equality. By 1914, the NACW has 50,000 members and a thousand clubs nationwide. So at the point, the NACW has 50,000 members and 1,000 clubs nationwide. The NAACP is only five years old. Many of these women, however, will um, be a part of the founding of other national organizations, such as the Niagara Movement, you see pictured here uh, at a Boston meeting in 1907, and it is the Niagara Movement that will give birth to the NAACP only two years later. These Black women are also involved in the founding of Black sororities at uh, historically Black colleges and universities. They're part of the founding of the Urban League and other local and national and civic organizations. And we'll see later uh, in, in the examples that are coming up now, how these women are moving back and forth between their church organizations, the NAACP, the women's organizations, the Republican Party, they are active and activists in civil rights and politics. We begin with Sarah Willie Layton. She was involved in both the Western Baptist Church Association of California and the California Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. So she's part of the church organization and the Colored Women's Club organization. And she also served as the California editor of the national newspaper, The Woman's Era, pictured on your screen. When her husband dies, she leaves California, goes to Philadelphia, where she becomes active in the National Baptist Convention. In other words, the largest organization of Black Baptist churches. And she becomes the founder of the Black Women's Convention in 1890. And that group of Black Baptist women will advocate for women's rights within the church. 
And it will also advocate for women's suffrage. It will collaborate with other organizations like the National Urban League, the Progressive Party, the Republican Party, and the National Women's Party. And so what I want you to see here again is the intersectionality. The women are working on political issues, race issues, women's issues, uh, economic issues, um, and serving the community all simultaneously. Another wonderful example is Rosina Tucker. Black women played a major role in the union movement for themselves in unionizing domestic workers, black domestic workers, but also in the formation of the first national union, um, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925. Rosina Tucker, the wife of a porter and union leader, visited some 300 porters at their homes in Washington area. And she's the one who's distributing the literature, recruiting members, collecting the dues, and also hosting meetings at her home. She also organized the Ladies Auxiliary, the Women's Economic Council, which raised funds for the union. When the Pullman Company learned about Rosina Tucker's union activities, they fired her husband in retaliation, not surprising. But this is what Tucker does. She goes to the supervisor's, her husband's supervisor's office, and this is what she says to the white supervisor. Uh, she is recounting that story in a film on the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. She says the following, I looked him right in the eye and banged on his desk and told him I was not employed by the Pullman Company and that my husband had nothing to do with any activity I was engaged in. I said, I want you to take care of this situation or I will be back. She says, he must have been afraid because a black woman did not speak to a white man in this manner. My husband was back on his run. You have to see the film to hear her tell this story. And now we look at the long civil rights movement that begins in the 1930s, 1930s, 40s. Um, and although there are continuities from the first generation of civil rights organ organizations in the 1880s to 1920s, historians Jacqueline Dowd Hall from University of North Carolina pictured here, as well as Professor Thomas Segru from New York University, um, they both argue persuasively that a long civil rights movement begins in the 1930s, 40s, and that we're missing a critical moment in civil rights history when we focus solely on that classic period of the 50s and 60s. And they suggest that this marks a turning point. And one of the things that uh, we can so easily see is that by the 30s and 40s, the organizations from the turn of the century are now in their second and third generation of organizing. That civil rights organizations, both the women's organizations and the um, uh, organizations such as NAACP Urban League that they helped to found are now in fact mature and clear in their focus and strategy. What their arguments uh, demonstrate is the importance of the 1930s and 40s uh, for the great migrations, the maturing of civil rights organization leadership, the evolution of a black professional class and the new relationship between FDR's executive branch and the socioeconomic needs of the American population from the depression and the impact of World War II. So in the 1930s, 1940s, we see black women leaders expand and solidify their roles. The Women's Economic Councils, for example, that Rosina Tucker began in the 1920s, continue to be a major organizational, financial, and educational component of black community um, unionizing. She helps to organize union plans for a march on Washington uh, that A. Philip Randolph threatens in 1941. And then she also helps to organize the march 
that actually occurs in 1963. Mary Church Terrell, who we saw earlier, the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, as well as Ada B. Wells Barnett, pictured here and called the princess of the black press because of her reporting on lynchings, despite having a uh, kind of wanted poster out on her in Memphis. Uh, these women and others will redefine the NAACP's agenda in the second and third generation as its membership soars with the growth of the black of black communities in northern cities following the migration. So that makes perfect sense that when you have millions of black people move from south to north over only a few years, and truly it is millions move. Um, the NAACP then uh, grows organically from this new pool of members. Let's look at some examples of what Black women are doing specifically in this, what we can consider the growth phase of the NAACP. Daisy Adams Lampkin in 1915 became the president of the Negro Women's Franchise League, a group dedicated to fighting for the vote. And again, over and over again, we will again hear these, hear these women organizing in three or four different organizations and platforms. In 1930, Walter White, the third executive secretary of the NAACP and the second black head of the organization, remember, we're talking about, again, it's important, this is the second and third generation. Walter White enlists Lampkin as a regional field secretary of the NAACP, a post she will hold and she'll, until she becomes the national field secretary in 1935. And then she becomes the major fundraiser for the entire national organization. Juanita Mitchell Jackson, uh, helped found the Citywide Young People's Forum, which encouraged young people to organize and combat unemployment, segregation, and lynching. Walter White, again, offered her the position as director of the NAACP's new youth program from 1935 to 1938. And then after that, she directed the NAACP's voter registration campaigns. Ella Baker, who we know of and will speak of again in terms of her work with SNCC, co-founded the Young Negroes Cooperative League in Harlem. She developed strategies for grassroots organizing and worked with women's and labor groups like the Harlem Housewives Cooperative, the Women's Day Workers and Industrial League, and the YWCA. She served as the publicity director of the National Negro Congress in the 1930s, and then she became an assistant field secretary of the NAACP. Ella Baker traveled nationwide, especially in the South. So Ella Baker is the one who's organizing NAACP chapters in the South. And then in 1943 to 46, she is the director of NAACP branches, and it is Ella Baker that builds up the organization's membership uh, post-World War II, or rather in World War II, as we have that second great migration and the NAACP membership increases even more. Um, I missed Fanny B. Beck who demonstrates the power of Black women's local civil rights work. She brought together 50 Black women to form the Detroit Housewives League, an organization that combined economic nationalism and Black women's self-determination to help Black families and businesses survive during the Depression. What the League focused on, and this sounds so familiar in terms of 2021, the League focused on supporting Black businesses, buying Black products, and patronizing Black professionals to keep money in the Black community. She formed leagues, 
Believes throughout the United States in Chicago, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Durham, New York, Cleveland, and other cities. Historians estimate that the league's boycott of businesses that didn't hire or refused to hire Black people ended up creating 75,000 new jobs for Black people. Mary McLeod Bethune, founder and president of Bethune Cookman College, one of our HBCUs, uh, served as president of the National Association of Colored Women from 1924 to 1928. That is that first consortium we talked about earlier where two organizations came together with Mary Church Terrell as the first president. In 1935, though, Mary McLeod Bethune is seeking to create what she calls an organization of organizations. And she brings together 29 Black women's religious, political, social organizations, and the Black sororities to form a new national Black women's organization. This tells us something about both intersectionality and hard work. From 1936 to 1942, Bethune will simultaneously, the president and founder of Bethune Cookman College, so she's a college president, and she's the first president and founder of this new organization, the National Council of Negro Women, and she's the director of Negro Affairs of the National Youth Administration, a New Deal agency. She has three full-time jobs. Uh, Bethune guides the NCNW to lobbying against lynching and racial violence, against racist practices in the military and housing and jobs and voting rights. And in 1945, when uh, the United Nations uh, was founded, the federal government gave the National Council of Negro Women, along with the NAACP, observer status to the international body. So think about the significance of that. The two, only two black organizations who get observer status given to them by the US government for the UN is the NAACP and this organization. Today, the NCNW includes 300 campus and community-based sections and 32 national women's organizations with its headquarters on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, DC. You see pictured here an article, an October 1944 article from the Chicago Defender. Mrs. Reese Taylor, a 24 year old black mother and sharecropper was walking home from church in Abbeville, Alabama on September 3rd, 1944, when she was abducted and gang raped by six white men. The crime, which the NAACP activist Rosa Parks investigated, garnered extensive coverage in the black press. And the crime never saw an indictment for the accused. In the film, The Rape of Recy Taylor, the director, Nancy Bursky, explores Taylor's story. Rosa Parks' work on her behalf and the history of racial violence, particularly against Black women. In her book, At the End of the Dark Street by Professor Daniel L. McGuire, McGuire writes the following, and I quote, after World War I, the Alabama Klan unleashed a wave of terror designed to return uppity African-Americans to their proper place in the segregated social order. Whites didn't like Blacks having that kind of attitude, Rosa Parks said, of Black soldiers returning to the South. Southerners instead, and I quote, started doing all kinds of violent things to Black people to remind them that they didn't have rights. It was against this backdrop that Rosa Parks witnessed and sought justice for the victims of widespread bigotry rippling throughout the state. Alongside other activists, Rosa Parks founded the Committee for Equal Justice for Mrs. Reese Taylor in 1945. 
With the support of some of the most well-known Black leaders in the country, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary Church Terrell, and the poet Langston Hughes, among others, this case rose to prominence. However, the, the accused, again, were never brought to justice. So faced with few options for legal recourse, once again, African-American women chose to share their stories, drawing on a long-standing history of testimony and truth-telling to shed light on their pain. Professor McGuire writes, while survivors of sexualized violence rarely receive justice in Southern courts, Black women like Recy Taylor, who were raped by white men in the 1940s, used their voices as weapons against white supremacy. It was not until 2011, nearly 60 years after this case, that the state of Alabama issued a formal apology to Taylor for her treatment by the state's legal system. And I quote from Representative Alabama Representative Terry A. Sewell, Taylor was an American hero and an Alabama treasure who spoke up in the face of racism, hate, and sexual violence. By standing up to injustice over six decades ago, Recy Taylor inspired generations of men and women to hold perpetrators of sexual violence accountable. McGuire's research though demonstrates the importance of grassroots movements in the 1940s. She shows that Recy, and I quote, Recy and women who suffered similar crimes told their stories in the face of intimidation, which brought nationwide attention to these issues. Although Recy Taylor's case failed in the short term, the bravery of these women helped to mobilize communities and build coalitions that would become the pillars of the civil rights movement. We will come back to this committee again when we look at the Montgomery bus boycott because Mrs. Park's 1945 organizing is critical to the organizing of the bus boycott a decade later. We now look at one of the, um, in some ways the original and, and first organizers of um, trying to get social justice on Montgomery buses. Joe N. Robinson, who taught at Alabama State University, became active in the Women's Political Council of Montgomery. The WPC was organized by African-American professional women uh, to foster involvement in civic affairs, to work on voter registration, to aid women who were victims of rape and assault. And jo when Joanne Robinson joins, she especially wants to work on the issue of how Black women are treated on the city's buses. The WPC will repeatedly complain to, the, to Montgomery city leaders about unfair seating practices and abusive driver conduct. And we need to understand that a bus is a tiny racialized space and people are on it every day. And so you can imagine, uh, or you should imagine that these altercations on the bus are occurring every day, all the time. Black people aren't let off the bus when they ring the bell for their stop. Sometimes the bus doesn't stop for them at all. There are constant, uh, uh, constant uh, juggling of racial space because the more white people get on, the black people have to get up and move. And so it is an intensified racialized space. Following Rosa Parks' arrest then in December 1955, so I want you to remember the WPC is organized in 1946 and starts this battle um, for various arenas of social justice, but the buses in particular, this is something Black women are working on. So when Rosa Parks refuses 
to give up her seat in December 1955 and she's arrested, Robinson and a few of her associates jump into action because this is what they have been working on all along. What Robinson and her group do is to copy tens of thousands of leaflets. And those of you, many of you on this, uh, um, uh, in this class do remember those blue mimeograph machines with the blue ink and you cranked out the copies. That's what this is. And they printed out tens of thousands of these leaflets and distributed them across the city. And it's these lift leaflets from the WPC that called for a one day boycott. There's no Montgomery Improvement Association. This is not being sent out by the NAACP. The call for the boycott comes from an organization of black women. Following the overwhelming success of that one day boycott they called for, Montgomery's black citizens decide to continue the campaign and they establish the Montgomery Improvement Association to organize the effort. And the NAACP calls on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to meet at his church and he is elected president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. But wait, I told you we would come back to Rosa Parks and her committee for Mrs. Reese Taylor. Danielle McGuire's research shows that the Montgomery Improvement Association that we, we think of in terms of maybe E.D. Nixon and Martin Luther King was actually born out of the um, Rosa Parks Committee. So it's Rosa Parks Committee that becomes the organizational structure and foundation for creating the Montgomery Improvement Association as well. And then finally, in terms of this boycott that we associate almost solely with men and in the national imagination, they associate Rosa Parks as being a tired old woman, which clearly is so far from the truth. We also know that most of the black bus riders and the boycotters in Montgomery were also black women who were going to jobs and domestic service in white homes. So although we know that the bus boycott established King, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a national figure and spokesperson for this classic phase of the 50s, 60s, it is not an exaggeration for us to conceive of this boycott as a black women's movement that combined the Women's Political Caucus, Mrs. Park's existing organization, and the mass movement of Black women who boycotted buses for almost a year, and all with the support of Black men. Robinson herself chose not to have an official position on the Montgomery uh, Improvement Association because she feared she would lose her job at Alabama State. But she worked behind the scenes for the MIA on its executive board, uh, Joanne Robinson wrote the weekly um, uh, Improvement Association's weekly newsletter. She volunteered to carpool to take Black people to and from work. And in her memoir, she says this, uh, in, in his memoir, I'm sorry, Dr. King says this about Joanne Robinson. Apparently indefatigable, she perhaps more than any other person was active on every level of the protests. And now we move to the period of mass action in the 1950s and 60s. The civil rights movement of the 50s, 60s was shaped by ordinary people taking extraordinary action. This includes black mothers and communities mourning for and protesting against the all too familiar and, and current innocent death of a black child as a victim of racial violence. In 1955, Mamie Till Mobley went on vacation to Nebraska, but her son Emmett wanted to visit his cousins in Money, Mississippi, where he was brutally murdered. His mother said, and I quote, 
I realized that this was a load that I was going to have to carry. I wouldn't get any help carrying this load. This grieving mother's decision to have an open casket funeral became a courageous statement, similar to Mrs. Reese Taylor's courageous statement, right? It became a courageous statement that we continue to hear today when Black children are murdered by those in authority. Black people know that this is our, our child. Mrs. Mobley said, and I quote, I think everybody needed to know what had happened to Emmett Teal. 50,000 people saw the teenager's corpse in Chicago and millions more saw it in the black press. Combined with the acquittal of the murderers, the verdict and case became international news, but the acquittal stood. President Dwight Eisenhower refused to meet with Mrs. Mobley when she asked to meet with him. And FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover wrote in a memo, quote, there has been no allegation made that the victim has been subjected to the deprivation of any right or privilege which is secured, protected by the Constitution of the laws of the United States. In continuing the civil rights fight to make her son's life and death matter, Mrs. Mobley gave speeches nationwide, which energized the civil rights movement of the 1950s and elevated black anger and galvanized black organizing. Membership in the NAACP soared because of her truth telling. Historians in fact see a direct link between Mrs. Mobley's willingness to publicly display her grief and to use the media in 1955 and Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her bus seat as the critical turning points in the civil rights movement and a shift to mass movement. I mentioned Ella Baker earlier and talking about women who played a key role in organizing it and expanding the work of the NAACP and for Ella Baker, she was working in the South, which was especially dangerous work to do. But here I want you to see her politics evolve beyond what she even saw as the confines of the NAACP strategies to nurture a new movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Ella Baker was born in 1903 in Northford, Virginia and graduated from Shaw University. She began her activist career as soon as she finished college in 1927 and went straight to New York and started organizing. As I said before, in the 1940s, she was a field secretary and a director of branches for the NAACP. On February 1, 1960, a group of Black college students from North Carolina A&T refused to leave a Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. Baker, who was with uh, Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, went to Greensboro to assist the student activists because she viewed these young emerging activists as a resource and an asset to the movement. And this is at the same time when Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy are telling these students to stop these students. So <clears throat> what Baker tells the students is, number one, you don't look, need to listen to the black ministers. Number two, you don't need to consider yourself a branch of their organizations. Ella Baker says, you should just start your own. And so she really is considered to be the kind of mother of SNCC. It is Ella Baker who teaches SNCC uh, members the Gandhian theories of nonviolent direct action. It is then SNCC along with CORE, as we know, who will organize and launch the 1961 Freedom Rides, organize the 1964 Freedom Summer. And it is Baker's influence that brings about that shift in the movement to a youth movement. 
Before we move to our last two people, Fanny, Fanny Lou Hamer and then Diane Nash, I wanted to just give you some sense of what voting looked like in the South. What you see here is the sworn written application for registration in Mississippi in 1955. And what you see in these questions I've excerpted for you is an example of questions of intimidation, asking people who employs them. Because we will see over and over and over again that as happened with Joanne Robinson, right? That black people's employment is threatened uh, if they are activists or even try to register to vote in Mississippi. I thought you would love seeing this Louisiana literacy test from uh, around 1963. I draw your attention to, actually it could be any of these. Let's try number 28. Divide a vertical line in two equal parts by bisecting it with a curved horizontal line that is only straight at its spot bisection of the vertical. And that was on the Louisiana literacy test for voting. Another example of a literacy test, a white applicant may be asked to copy and interpret Article 12, Section 240, which says all elections by the people shall be by ballot. And they would have to interpret that, write it and interpret it. A Black applicant might be asked to copy and interpret the Article 7, Section 182 Corporate Tax Code and interpret it. So now we look at Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, this is her world of trying to um, register to vote and also to be part of the voting rights movement in Mississippi. Fannie Lou Hamer, born in 1917, was the 20th child of her parents who were sharecroppers. She, she grew up as a sharecropper, married a sharecropper, and uh, because she was literate, she had the job on a uh, plantation of, doing, um, of being the bookkeeper. In 1961, uh, she is involuntarily uh, sterilized. Uh, which politicizes her when her own body becomes uh, not her own. Um, and in her voting rights campaign, she and 17 of her neighbors attempt to register to vote. And of course, they aren't allowed to vote. And then she and her husband are thrown off the land by the landowner. Recognizing Fannie Lou Hamer's strength and power in this uh, voting, uh, in her early voting efforts, uh, that she is leading with her neighbors. When SNCC comes to Mississippi in 1962, they recognize her as a leader and she becomes part of SNCC work in 1962. On June 9th, 1963, Hamer and several activists were turning from a training program in Charleston, South Carolina, when they are stopped and arrested and Hamer is beaten uh, um, with damage done to her eyes, legs and kidneys that will affect her for the rest of her life. Following her release on June 12th, Hamer and SNCC workers find out about Mecker Evers assassination. This doesn't stop them. They go on to organize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964. And you see here the picture of Fannie Lou Hamer testifying before the Democratic Party's Credentials Committee. When Lyndon Johnson uh, sends uh, his vice president, uh, um, Hubert Humphrey, to tell the uh, MFDP that they can have two rep non-voting representatives at the convention. Fannie Lou Hamer uh, replies to them, um, uh, let me read the entire quote. She says, if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. 
Is this America the land of the free and the home of the brave where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? And then the response she gives to Humphrey to take back to Johnson is, we didn't come all this way for no two seats. After the delegation returns to uh, Mississippi, Hamer continues to make speeches nationwide throughout the 1960s. She's raising money for civil rights organizations. And even after the Voting Rights Act is passed in 1965, Fannie Lou Hamer is helping with lawsuits and uh, that leads to the first elections of large numbers of black residents in her own county. We end with Diane Nash, appropriately so. We end with SNCC. Um, we know more and think more about Stokely Carmichael as the name and the leader and the president of SNCC, but it is Diane Nash who was one of the most powerful and militant leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1960s. Diane was born into a middle class. Catholic Black family in Chicago. She comes south to Fisk to go to school. And when she got to Nashville, she says, I started feeling very confined and really resented it. Every time I obeyed a segregation rule, I felt like I was somehow agreeing I was too inferior to go through the front door or to use the facility that the ordinary public would use. So as part of the Nashville student movement in 1960, Nash and others held sit-ins, tried to desegregate lunch counters and boycotted downtown stores. Um, Nash then becomes one of the founding members of SNCC and one of its most militant. Uh, they, uh, she and fellow SNCC leaders launch sit-ins uh, for the nine students who are jailed in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And uh, as is her um, uh, belief, she always refuses bail. This is what Diane Nash said about the Freedom Rides. The students had decided that we can't let violence overcome. She's talking to Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who's representing Martin Luther King, who's telling the Freedom Riders to stop, that it is too dangerous. But Diane Nash says this, we're coming into Birmingham to continue the Freedom Ride. In 1961, Nash was arrested for conducting nonviolent workshops for Black youth in Jackson, Mississippi. Nash told the judge she would serve the entirety of her two-year sentence. And by that point, she is married and pregnant with her first child, and she is telling the judge, I will take the two years in prison. However, she served only 10 days with a contempt charge because the judge thought, and I quote, I think they just decided it was likely to be more trouble than they had banked on. Nash, a field worker, organizer, strategist, went on to help organize the 1963 Birmingham desegregation campaign, worked along with Dr. Martin Luther King and SCLC during the Selma voting rights campaign. And so as I conclude, when we look at these, this last group of leaders, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer and Diane Nash, we see they are all connected through SNCC and it's a defiance of the older generation of civil rights organizations and their strategies. Even Martin Luther King, who was himself young, he still followed the traditional patriarchal organizational structures of the black church where women were deemed to be helpers when they had actually been leading and organizing all along. SNCC itself doesn't significantly shift these patriarchal forms. I think the women themselves demand positions of leadership. They take charge and command their own positions and defy the NAACP, SCLC, the Black church, patriarchy, 
and older generations. Our own Black Lives Matter movement of the 21st century, uh, we should see as a continuation of a long legacy that reflects significant generational and gendered shifts in movement leadership. In describing their leadership in 2016, Ford Mag Magazine, uh, in describing these three Black women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tobiti, in describing them, we could be describing Mary Church Terrell, or Anna Julia Cooper, or Ida B. Wells Barnett, or Mary McLeod Bethune, or Rosa Parks, or Diane Nash. These modern social movements, Forbes says, often fizzle after their moment in the national news, but Black Lives Matter has steadily gained momentum since its founding in 2013. This is the generation that the Black women of the civil rights movement from the 1880s inspired and launched the four mothers of these three Black women would be very proud of their movement. Thank you. Anyone has any questions, they can unmute themselves. And we're on more than one screen, so I think, uh, no, I think I can see everyone. Um, so if you want to just unmute or if you want to use the raise hand, questions, comments. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful as usual. It's, I just, I'm just so amazed at all the knowledge you have and I just want to say thank you for sharing. Well, this is me benefiting from so much research that uh, Black women historians in particular have been doing uh, pretty much over the past 30 years. And so kind of resurrecting these kind of invisible Black women, um, I was saying to Maurice before we started that some of this is so, you know, when you begin to ask the historical questions like, as the NAACP grew exponentially and really quickly, right? with the first migration in the 1920s and then the second migration in the 1940s, who's doing all this organizing, right? Who is, who is talking to branches? Who is working with them? Who is sending them information? And what we see from just the few examples I gave you, this national organiz organizing that Walter White is appointing is to, is to Black women are in charge of the national organizing of the NAACP, but we don't see them because the presence, right, the visual presence actually is going to be Walter White himself. It's going to be the executive board. It's not going to be that grassroots organizing, right? I was actually surprised that the Black Lives Matter started in 2013. Which Last year was the year that we were really made aware of it. Before that, not quite. Well, I thought it was interesting when I saw the kind of accolade from Forbes magazine and what they were um, lauding in this movement is its um, staying power. And they actually compared it to, um, uh, what, what was it? The, um, the Wall Street. Street. Yeah. What was it, Maurice? Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street. Right. They kind of came and went and just, just, I mean, it just mm -hmm. disappeared completely. Black Lives Matter not only has staying power, but we can say in 2021, the, the urgency has it, of it has expanded because Black lives are still being taken. So it isn't as if, well, we don't have a problem anymore, but rather, uh, the the uh, awareness and the truth telling about the um, uh, how black lives are endangered 
ha has become public and in some ways social media has played a key role in revealing that. And then we have even the fact that police officers uh, nationwide are being uh, uh, told they have to wear body cameras, right? Uh, that it is now a requirement. That's from Black Lives Matter. That would never have happened. I mean, and so the, 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 the impact of the movement is there, but it's also very clear that there is still so much work to be done. And day to day to day, you know, Black men, women, and children still fear for the violence from police authority and that it can happen at any time to absolutely anybody. That has always been the case, right? That we've seen from the earlier history um, uh, but now there is a national platform, right, for that to appear and someone needed to put it on the national platform, right? And so when I look at these three young women, one of the things I think about is Ada B. Wells having the nerve to write about the lynching of Black men, right? Three <laughs> of her friends are lynched in Memphis because they have a successful business they are dragged out of their businesses a, and hung up, right? And so Ida B. Wells writes about this lynching and she says, I know these men, I'm the godmother of one of their children. These men didn't rape any white woman. Kind of, and then she goes on to say, all of that's a lie. <laughs> the raping a white women story is a lie. And then she says something like, uh, if white men aren't more careful, they're continuing to tell this story about black men raping their women will impugn the reputation of their women. It's like, whoa. And then she gets a price on her head and has to leave town because they're out to kill her. Mm. But that, I mean, that's the kind of, uh, kind of uh, boldness that uh, the foremothers had that I see in this generation. And, and, and for those of us who are historians and can see the parallels and the uh, continuities, it's, it's fairly easy to, to applaud that kind of um, agency that we know has always been the case throughout our history. It seems to be just the same thing over and over, over all these years. It's just, we push down, they push up. So it seems to be just, you know, with the influence for the last four years with the administration, it's just been a mess and just right. aggravated I would, so much yeah. more. I would say that white supremacy and racism pretty much looks the same. And it also looks the same when you go, you know, you can take, uh, the recent increase in uh, uh, racism against, against uh, Asian Americans, uh, yeah. the kind of, you know, you see an anti Semitism, the historic anti Irish, anti Italian, anti Catholic. I mean, the way, I mean, psychologists and historians know the way a society frames a group as being less than human and deserving, right? It isn't that they've done anything. This idea of framing a group of human beings as inherently infi inferior, right? So that yes, you can kill black children because they aren't human beings, right? And that's true in every society that frames this kind of murdering of parts of their population. What is different is the historical context in which these occur, right? So America is not Nazi Germany, is not Rwanda, is not Cambodia, it's not, you know, Native Americans on the Trail of Tears. I mean, we can go around the world and find, right, these, um, uh, um, you know, historic moments of horror of genocide and uh, the framing of people as less than human. Those contexts, you know, the historical um, evolution of how this happens will not be the same. But what happens, right? The framing of people of being less than human, 
that that does in fact Jennifer look very similar to me. Mm. But what I tell my students is that what I want them to be able to do is to identify it anywhere and with anyone, right? Anywhere on the globe with any group of human beings, they should now uh, have um, know the cues, right? Uh, the cues when any group of human beings is being somehow placed in any other category of humanity, that it is a dangerous direction. Um, so the question about Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. is that name trademarked? And if so, did who, who owns the name? I know it appeared in a hashtag, right, is, is how it first appears, but I'm not sure if it was trademarked or not. I have no idea. That's a very good question. Because yeah. people have come up with other names also, like, um, you know, gay lives matter, this different type of uh, lives matter. So I was just wondering about black lives, if it's actually trademarked. It's I not. Actually, it's, it's not, not Joyce? No, it's not. Hi, Joyce. <laughs> Hi, how are you? It's not Good. trademarked. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much, Lily. Um, it, it is not trademarked and an effort was um, initially made to try to trademark, but by the time that effort had been made, it had been so much uh, in the public domain, mm -hmm. that once that happens, the opportunity to trademark passes by. Right. Thank you. Very Thank you, Joyce. Yeah. Susan? Yeah, so um, Lily, I just love your passion for this topic. It's just, it's like intoxicating. And I just, I saw you last month at the, at the League's event. Oh, yeah. And it has just... Uh, open. I mean, I've always, I thought I was very open and I just am even more open to the lack of education with, um, mm -hmm. you know, in our school system was just, you know, I want to dedicate a lot of my time in the future to do that. And recently I, um, somehow it came across my, you know, whatever, some social media or something or an email that had, um, it was a nine minute clip from the Boston PBS station, mm -hmm. WBGH or something. And it was about how black, got started how white got started and oh, yeah. yeah and it was so part my my partner's actually a um got a history degree from Rutgers Newark and mm -hmm. um he's I go do you know who Lord Berkeley is have you heard about this huh. he's <laughs> like well it, I remember something about Jamestown but you know anyway it was a little foggy so then I looked it up on Wikipedia and, and this is this is what blows my mind. So I look it up on Wikipedia and it says, oh, it was a Native American uprising. Now, according to, now there's, and then according to this nine minute video, it was a way, you know, the, the indentured white serv servants and the blacks and the Native Americans were all toiling in the fields and they were all very unhappy with the working conditions. And it was a purposeful, I mean, this is what the nine minute video was saying, a purposeful way to reduce the ability for poor people oh. to organize and get together. And that maybe that's not true. I don't know, but Wikipedia- oh, you're, has you, you're referring to Bacon's Rebellion, right? Yes. 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 No, that, that is in general what uh, historians now um, uh, and scholars agree uh, from, of course, one historian putting forth the uh, very compelling theory that uh, with Bacon's Rebellion, what, where, in fact, I mean, when you look at the history of, uh, let's say, servile labor of, you know, this, this almost gray area in the early colonial period where you have black and white indentured servants, right? Yeah. And, as, and, and people have to, you know, when you're indentured, you really are owned, but it's for a specific period of time. Uh, you have, as is often the case, black and white poor people and working class people you know, living together, getting drunk together, working together, having babies together, kind of, which is what people do. Um, and with Bacon's Rebellion, that really is this um, uh, uh, small farmers and enslaved people and indentured servant, I mean, the whole stratum at the bottom. Uh, remembering colonial society is not one of, you know, it's not a very democratic system at all. 
it's British and heavily class based, right? <laughs> that's, that's the colonial inheritance. It's not one of individual freedom at all. And so, you know, they are rebelling in order to get their piece of the American economy. And uh, so the, the deal that's made is, is to fr enfranchise all white males, to give mm -hmm. all white male, to have universal white male suffrage, which they did not have. You know, you couldn't vote a whole office if you didn't own land or a certain amount of land, right? And to shift from having no indentured servants. And so what is clear in the historical record, the number of indentured, number of white indentured servants falls off a cliff, <laughs> kind of, there are none. And black people are no longer indentured, they are only enslaved. And all of that happens around a specific time period. And of course, historians don't see any of this as coincidental. Right, so you have black, poor whites, can't, don't wanna, you know, they're separating poor whites from poor blacks and then uh, Native American, poor Native American. So all the poor folks who should be gaining together to fight for the, their common, you know, yeah. situation. Now they purposely, and what, 400 and plus years ago, this happened and they're, you know, it's still happening. You know, it's still yeah. happening. Yes. You know, so it's just, it was, it blew my mind. It was like, oh my God. Oh, yeah. Everybody oh, should watch this nine minute video. It was like, wow. That's what they call divide and conquer. Yes. That's what they did in South Africa with the black people. Exactly. They divided the blacks and the colors and the Indians and the Chinese, divided them all and the whites remained that one group and they divided and conquered for a while until. Yeah. And the so thing that, that one of the things that's so uh, um, kind of frightening in the 21st century is that people still do this trade off of win lose kind of, you know, if black people have opportunity, then it is taken away from somebody else, which actually makes no sense. I mean, in some ways it's, a, it's almost a very undemocratic and we might think of as un-American concept that there isn't enough freedom to go around, right? <laughs> we only have that much. We have only that much equality and freedom. And you know, if you you if you give somebody eighty percent of it, then you only have twenty percent left. You know, it's a pie sort of. It's a it's a zero to freedom, which makes no sense. Right? But don't you see it as a zero sum game where there is a concerted effort to make sure that there's always always. Um, an underclass. There's I'm always a group yes. of people that are demonized and it, it even seems to allow people who really are at the bottom of the economic totem pole. And I look at what happened here uh, in 2020, the number mm -hmm. of people who could benefit so much from the Affordable Care Act, from mm -hmm. the um, the COVID relief funds who are against it because they believe in some way, shape, form, or fashion, it benefits people of color. Right. And it's just woven into the fabric of this society in a way that you don't see, except in, um, in a caste society, because I just finished reading um, Cast. Bill Wilkerson's book, Cast. And what we've done mm -hmm. is we've created a caste society here. Mm -hmm that is in, in, in transient and intractable. Right. And it makes no sense except perhaps in a slightly economic sense because that always gives you people to exploit. And is it, I mean, one thing that I, after watching, you know, reading up about this was, uh, you know, because they use skin color, you can't hide it, right? Like with indentured servitudes or like, you know, all the Irish or all the Italians could be, you know, on the, you know, in different, you know, like in England, right? There were a lot of white poor people and, did you know from looking at them? Not necessarily, or in India. Mm -hmm. But the thing about the American caste system is it's skin color. Absolutely. So it doesn't matter how, how, what what you do or you know how you you know you you uh, overcome. You still have the skin color. You know, the color color trumps everything. And it lasts. I don't know. I don't know the history. You probably know better, Doctor Edwards. But I would think that the American this. American system, I think you had mentioned in our last 
meeting that I was at was that the Germans looked at our systems yes. and they thought it was too horrible or something to like, <laughs> use yes. in Germany. The but Nazis. like, oh, yeah, the Nazis, like, the Nazis are they wouldn't, yes. they wouldn't adopt it. It was so awful. Yeah. yeah, the Nazis studied our system of, well, there are two things I've talked about. The Nazis studying the American system of racism and what you do with the population you have deemed to be inferior and second class and how you in fact create a society and laws and systems around that subjugation. Uh, and then the other thing I talked about was the colonial era where the British, British and Germans, Belgians also, looked at Tuskegee and vocational education as a model of how you create a servile working class mm -hmm. that has a certain level of education in order to serve the needs of the larger society, but without any sense of advancement of that group itself. Well, I feel like now, I mean, back in the day, you couldn't, right, slaves couldn't be educated. They weren't, right, right. it was against the law to educate a slave. I feel like we're just, re we're doing that now, right? We're doing that in um, yeah. towns oh. of, you know, concentrations of right. color, there's horrible, right. you know, achievement outcomes because, um, you know, educational outcomes. And I just feel like, we, we you know, we still haven't come anywhere, it's just crazy. Do we have the longest lasting? We can't, I guess India is probably the longest lasting caste system like that, or are we just the best at it? Or, you know, what, how do we rank compared to the other ones? Not that it's something to be proud of, obviously, but I just feel like we're the worst one out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there are all of these societies that will say, as as America will, that, 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 that these, uh, um, discriminatory systems don't exist anymore. You know, like Brazil will say they don't have racism, that they're a multicultural society. And you ask the black people in Brazil and they'll say, no, that's not true. You know, England like, likes to think of itself as a class rather than race society. And, and now we know all too well, hey, you could have both a class mm -hmm. society based on class and race. Um, caste system, of course, still exists in India. I mean, that, that hasn't changed, right? Um, and then you have what we know to be true in the United States is you do not, laws alone do not erase the generational harm that has been done, if only economically, right? It, it doesn't redress uh, the, you know, economic cost of, you know, what we saw, I think, in, in one of the classes I did, I guess it was the one on HBCUs with Mill, you know, with, you know, Black teachers being paid half of what white teachers were paid. I mean, there's no, you know, there's, there's an economic harm that goes through every generation, right? For centuries and centuries, it adds yeah. up, it adds up. Yeah. There, there's a lot of literature that looks at governmental policies that dissipated the opportunity to build wealth. Home ownership is oh, yeah. one of the major sources of yeah. generational wealth that can be passed down. And yet the Veterans Administration, the Federal Housing Administration blatantly and in writing discriminated against black vets who came back from the war, they could never ever get a federally guaranteed home loan. Right. Therefore they could never own, own property. Right. So you're absolutely right. It's generational, it has longstanding economic impact. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you about something that is often um, discussed and read in classes um, that outside of the traditional classroom, the Willie Lynch letter. Mm -hmm. which is um, deemed to be the instructions of a white slave owner that he published on how to make sure that slaves remain slaves throughout eternity. And yet I'm starting to see that or, or read that that is not a real document, that it wasn't ever really published. Do you know um, anything about, about that? H have you seen no. the Whip Lynch letter? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll share I will, it with you. I will pull it up. I mean, there are, you know, very um, uh, well known and well used primary sources of defenses of slavery 
and very detailed uh, descriptions of Black people's inferiority and why they're inferior and why slavery is good for Black people. There's lots of that primary literature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, everything from Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia in 1787 talks very eloquently as Jefferson would about black inferiority and everything that we don't we don't care about our families that we're over sex that we don't have uh, ability to do higher mathematics we don't have reason we are not you know we can't write real real literature Phyllis Wheatley is okay but there's not real poetry I mean he just it's great 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 oh and we aren't beautiful either and we smell bad I mean it's <laughs> It's just so detailed uh, that it's very useful for class. <laughs> um, and then you have um, the uh, J John C. Calhoun, I think is the you know, senator obviously who comes up with the positive good theory of slavery. Mm -hmm. and, and again, great detail writes about how America is doing nothing more than replicating the great civilizations of Greek and Rome. He leaves out the fact that they no longer exist. But anyway, how we're re replicating the great civilizations of Greek and Rome. And one of the things that made them great was having slaves. That's what he argues, right? Mm -hmm. And that having this inferior population do manual labor and having control over them releases the superior race to do great and marvelous things. Um, and then, you know, some of the stuff after uh, slavery is over gets even worse. Yeah, you know, I, I showed in one of the presentations, uh, Joyce, a book by Charles Carroll called The Negro a Beast. I mean, that is the title. Oh yeah, I'm familiar with right, it. Right, right. So uh, I think we have more than enough primary sources about you know just how deep the racist ideology goes. And and to Susan's point, it also represents the inherent irrationality of racism, right? Because a people you deem to be inferior, you would not fear their learning because how dangerous could it be? Mm -hmm. it, is, it is, right? It's inherently contradictory that somehow um, uh, feeding the black intellect will threaten white supremacy. And yet on the other hand, you're saying black intellect is inferior and that it couldn't threaten white supremacy. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is they know that. <laughs> it's no, quite obvious. No, it's not true. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. You know, but it reminds me of some of the illogic that we hear in 2021, kind of, uh, you know, why would Texas want to teach that Black people, right, were not enslaved and we were immigrants? I mean, how do you, I mean, what is it in any context where you frame people being stolen, branded, bought and sold, stripped naked, examined, mm -hmm. you know, have a deed with, you know, saying that you own them. How, do, how are you gonna tell children that those are immigrants? But that is what is being suggested in different places in the country. Yeah. And Texas is a, a very interesting um, place. Interesting. Every day there's some shocking <laughs> ignorance that comes out of that, that state from that the coronavirus is, is really going away and they see people dying left, right and center uh, from it, that the wall has been built and you can see that that's not true. It's, uh, and that, um, you know, it was okay. The, the, the grid was fine. It, it, it really didn't fail. It was the bad behavior of people like AOC who talked about climate change that made those storms come and kill those people and cut off their electronic, their electric supply. It's a very strange uh, state that I'm 
wouldn't want to live in and certainly I don't like to pass through and certainly wouldn't want to live in. But here's the thing we do know from history, Joyce, that again, is the, the lesson I try and teach, teach my own students or when I was in the classroom. Now you are all my students. Um, <laughs> and that is um, this kind of language we have heard before, right? We have heard this kind of language uh, before. And so when I, when I did my presentations on uh, uh, Jewish scholars coming to the, refugee scholars coming to the United States and talk about Nazi Germany, of course, one of the first people who have to go, I mean, this is like 1933, right? You need to burn the books and you need to get rid of the scholars who will tell the truth. Right, that's one of the first things you do. I mean, it happens in, in Handmaid's Tale too, right? In the, in the fiction that is just too close to reality to even think about. Um, but that is consistent with, um, uh, I think one of the things I did in, in a presentation is, is consistent with what, what uh, despotic systems do. This is exactly, I mean, it's like the, 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 the um, uh, you know, the rule book for despots, right? You make stuff up. And we saw that for four years, every playbook, every rule in the playbook was used in the last four years. It, yeah. it, it was astounding to be here right. in this country and watch it unfold and watch it have so much support. Yeah, well, one of the things, one of the reasons it scares me, so I, I work very, very closely with my colleagues at Drew who were in, um, uh, who are in Holocaust and genocide studies. And one of them who uh, was in the psychology department worked on the whole issue of how does an entire nation become complicit, right? Yeah. Not only become complicit, but kind of on one end become complicit and at the same time are in denial of being complicit. Mm -hmm. And when I look at, um, you know, the cultivation of a kind of lying culture, right? It terrifies me in terms of people being so easily manipulated. And all I can think of is this is not new. We have seen it before and we know exactly what can happen. We know what, we know what the possible trajectories are right. and they are terrifying. You're absolutely right. I mean, I listened to some of those um, QAnon folks and the things that they were, I mean, rational human beings that you would think would have been appalled at what this whole QAnon movement was all about, believed it and had to be deprogrammed to walk away from it. Um, yeah. And we've got people in Congress who are just spreading the lie over and over again. Right. But you just hope that cooler heads and, and, and stronger minds and greater intellect will prevail. Yeah. But I, I believe, and again, I'm not no psychologist. And as my husband says, I didn't even have Psych 101. <laughs> uh, but, I, but but I have to believe that there, uh, and I, I do know anthropologists would say this, and that is, there is a reason why people are susceptible to believing certain things, that there is something also already going on in society and in their heads and in their lives that all someone has to do is like turn on, you know, kind of hit that on switch mm -hmm. and people will fall in line. And right. what we need to do is to find out what is that thing that makes people so susceptible that they will, they, they will believe something that is contradicted uh, by evidence that's right in front of them. Right. Yeah. Well, I know we, we are going over time, Maurice. I assume you're still there, adult school Montclair. <laughs> <laughs> right here. We could we could go on all night, I know, but um, I don't want to to um, 
take up all of your, your evening. This is wonderful. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you. And, and, um, the Amistad Commission has got to make sure that this kind of information is woven into our curriculum in the various school districts around the state. This was superb. Thank you so much. Well, Great thank discussion. You. Thank you so much. Great thank discussion. You, I hope to see all of you uh, again. I don't know when I will. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure when I will be back, but I'll be, of course, working with uh, the Dutch School as well as Mill for uh, other presentations in the future, I hope.